Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to our third and final unit within our acetylcholine chapter. This time we're talking about acetylcholine receptors. Okay, first up, let's talk about nicotinic receptors. Um, these are, of course, the receptor that nicotine binds to, but it's important to keep in mind that these aren't just receptors that are designed for nicotine use, right? Uh, they're named that because that's something we know that it binds to them, but they work with our endogenous acetylcholine, of course. So what nicotinic receptors do are they are ionotropic. Uh, they contain a pore that is permeable to both sodium and calcium. And in response to acetylcholine binding, they produce a fast excitatory response both in the central and the peripheral nervous system. As mentioned, they of course respond to nicotine um, as well. They're comprised of five protein subunits. So what we mean by uh, receptor subunits is each of these little pieces right here of the receptor is its own protein that sort of come together to form the acetylcholine receptor. So if you want to think of this as like five little meerkats standing around a heat lamp, which I think everyone does, um, each little meerkat here would be its own little protein and they come together to form a receptor with a pore in the middle. So just like that. So importantly, uh, these can be expressed presynaptically where they can function as heteroreceptors. So um, that means they can participate in the process of presynaptic facilitation. So when acetylcholine stimulates a terminal, it can enhance neurotransmitter release. Okay, so here's a crappy drawing of what that might look like. So if we have our uh, neuron here that's releasing, I don't know, let's say it's releasing glutamate, it's doing its thing, releasing glutamate, and here is our postsynaptic neuron. Wow, that looks terrible. Um, if we were to have a heteroreceptor, let's just draw that right here, a little heteroreceptor and we could have a acetylcholine neuron coming in here from somewhere else. And it releases some acetylcholine onto this heteroreceptor, and that's going to increase the amount of glutamate or whatever this neuron is releasing, right? So that's presynaptic facilitation, which we talked about forever ago. Okay, just a little reminder what that might look like. So let's say we've got our presynaptic neuron here, and it is uh, synapsing onto a terminal here, oh, that looks pretty terrible, um, and it's releasing its uh, neurotransmitter, let's say glutamate or something like that. And we'll draw our little uh, acetylcholine nicotinic receptor right here as a heteroreceptor. So here we have another neuron coming in. This is our acetylcholine producing neuron. And it's going to release some acetylcholine here onto this terminal's heteroreceptor. And when that heteroreceptor is stimulated, it's going to cause some presynaptic facilitation that's going to increase the amount of neurotransmitter being released. We see some more glutamate release. And that increase, it's supposed to be an up arrow, that increase, wow, that sucks, okay. That increase in a neurotransmitter release is presynaptic facilitation. So that's what's happening with the heteroreceptor that's being expressed presynaptically. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about those recept nicotinic receptor subunits. So as I mentioned, each acetylcholine Acetylcholine nicotinic receptor contains five protein subunits, and these subunits are named alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon. So um, we name the receptors based on which of these protein subunits they contain. So while there are five protein subunits, the possible combination of these subunits result in a wide variety of nicotinic receptor types. And if you were thinking that's not quite complicated enough, you're in luck because there are 10 alpha subunit types and four beta subunit types. So in addition to being classified as alpha through epsilon, alpha and beta have different subunit types. So alpha four, for example, alpha seven, uh, beta two, um, there are all of these different subunit types there. So our muscle and uh, neuron cells uh, differ in composition in terms of the subunits that comprise them. We're not gonna go into extreme detail here. There are just too many receptor subtypes to exhaustively discuss all of them. So we're just gonna mention some of the more important ones. Uh, we have two receptor types that are important for cognitive aspects of acetylcholine. There are the alpha four, beta two, and the alpha seven uh, composition. So we can see here, we have two alpha-4 subunits and three beta-2. Um, then here we have alpha-7, which is comprised entirely of alpha-7 subunits. 
So the convention for interpreting uh, acetylcholine nicotinic receptor subtypes is the number in parentheses is the is which subunit type it is. So in parentheses we have beta four or sorry alpha four beta two. Uh, the subscript is how many make up that receptor. So alpha four with the subscript of two tells us that there's two alpha four receptors and so on. Um, other compositions exist and uh, distribution varies based on brain area. So there are many combinations that are possible and that do exist and where they are and what they do depends a lot on the region of the brain that we're talking about. Again, we are just not going to get into the weeds enough in this class to really dissect out um, all of the permutations that exist. So for example here you can see a couple of different regions that are important for uh, various functions with the um, receptor subtypes that are expressed preferentially there. Don't feel like you need to memorize this. I'm not going to quiz you on like what the three receptor types found in the cerebellum are. I think that's a little bit, uh, like I said, too far into the weeds. But this is just to illustrate that there are many, many different types of nicotinic receptor and their expression varies based on what area of the brain we're talking about. So talking further about our nicotinic receptors, there are three functional states that this ionotropic receptor can exist in. The first is closed, right? Pictured right here. Uh, no neurotransmitter or agonist is bound, so it is in the closed formation. You can see here the pore is not permeable to ions. Open, we've also discussed previously. This is when a neurotransmitter or agonist is bound, as you can see here, to its receptor site. The pore opens, which will allow the passage of ions, sodium and calcium, like we talked about earlier. And finally, these can be desensitized. So uh, ionotropic receptors can exist in a desensitized state in which the pore is closed and cannot be opened. You can see that right over here. Um, this is caused by uh, repeated exposure to an agonist, so overstimulation basically of these nicotinic receptors, uh, which will cause desensitization where it's put into a state where it's closed and the pore cannot be opened. Though even with continuous exposure, not everything will desensitize. We can encounter something called depolarization block which is um, a, loss of the, a loss of the resting potential. And the result of this depolarization block is that the cell cannot be excited until the agonist clears and the membrane repolarizes. So through this desensitization process, basically we can throw the resting membrane potential out of whack and prevent that cell from being excited once again. This is the mechanism by which some uh, muscle relaxants work, right? Because we're talking specifically about our nicotinic system, um, they can cause um, disruption of uh, normal signaling in this way. Okay, let's talk briefly about some notable nicotinic agents. Uh, first off, we have a uh, succinylcholine, which will produce its relaxant effect through receptor desensitization, like we just talked about on the previous slide. Of course, the ever-present nicotine, which we've uh, touched on previously, and we'll talk about in much more detail later on. Um, this has a higher affinity for central nervous system receptors than for our peripheral receptors, so it, pr it produces its most most of its effect on our central nervous system, and this will agonize most central nicotinic receptors, so it will bind to most of the receptor subtypes found in our central nervous system, uh, preferring that over our periphery. Uh, there's also the antagonist d tubocurinine which is the um, found in, that's the main active ingredient found in curare, that toxin that we touched on previously. This is an antagonist of muscle nicotinic receptors, so those receptors found in our neuromuscular junctions, uh, this will cause paralysis, right, by serving as an antagonist of our uh, acetylcholine receptors in our neuromuscular junctions. This has little effect on central nervous system transmission because, one, it has high affinity for muscle receptors, and two, has a low permeability at the blood-brain barrier. So I've mentioned previously, I believe, that curare was often used by some indigenous populations as a poison to, uh, to hunt game with because... Um, will cause paralysis if an animal is infected or is, uh, you know, hit with a dart containing this curare substance. Um, but it can be safe to consume because um, it does not cross the blood-brain barrier very easily, so it's not likely to produce any central effects. So there also exist muscarinic receptors. Uh, muscarinic receptors are metabotropic in nature. Uh, these are denoted much more simply as M1 through M5. Um, we're not going to get into too much detail about how uh, these various types work. They are varied, so each of these has different mechanisms. 
Um, basically, they operate via various second messenger pathways. They activate various protein kinases or inhibit the activation of various protein kinases. Uh, many of these can stimulate a potassium channel opening as well. So they work pretty similarly to other muscarinic receptor, I'm sorry, other metabotropic receptor types we've talked about. But uh, again, that the scope of discussing all of these different mechanisms is a little bit too wide just because the metabotropic function is uh, so varied with acetylcholine. So we can't go into great detail about all of these receptors, but let's talk about a little bit, uh, an example. So let's talk about muscarinic M5. Uh, this is found primarily in the hippocampus, hypothalamus, and midbrain, uh, midbrain dopaminergic areas, so areas where we're seeing dopamine action. Uh, these muscarinic receptors uh, that are metabotropic contribute to the excitatory effect of dopamine neurons um, that's mediated by excitation from nicotinic receptors. So probably somewhat surprisingly, unsurprisingly rather, uh, this is involved in the rewarding and dependence-producing effects of some abused drugs. So uh, we mentioned uh, previously how nicotinic receptors are part of this pathway, and they're just more of a sort of uh, simple ionotropic receptor that's allowing um, sodium and calcium in, whereas the uh, M5 receptor is metabotropic and is going to be um, producing all those effects through second measure, messenger cascades and things like that. So it's kind of working in parallel with a different mechanism than uh, nicotinic receptors. So in this diagram here, we have a cholinergic neuron located in our hindbrain that is um, releasing some acetylcholine onto this dopamine-producing neuron in our ventral tegmental area, which is, of course, part of our reward pathway. And this is going to sort of facilitate the release of dopamine into our nucleus accumbens, which is important for all of those effects of um, reinforcement and the dependence-producing effects seen in many abused drugs. Notably, uh, genetic knockout mice that are uh, deficient for the M5 receptor uh, show deficits in uh, morphine and cocaine reward. So these are highly reinforcing drugs that work in this system. Importantly, these aren't um, nicotinic drugs, right? They're not like nicotine that are working specifically on acetylcholine receptors. This just shows that sort of the normal functioning of acetylcholine and its action on M5 receptors is important for a perception of... Um, things like morphine and cocaine reward. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, muscarinic action in the peripheral nervous system. Since we talked about it in the central nervous system, let's talk about what it does outside of the central nervous system. It's found all over the place. Uh, we see it in cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, organs, and even in our insulin-secreting pancreatic cells. So let's talk about what it's doing in all of those domains. So M2 receptors are found on cardiac muscle, and um, Innervation of these by our parasympathetic nervous system, which we talked about earlier in our discussion of organization, right? If parasympathetic is important for like rest and digest, conserving energy, um, this will slow the heart and decrease contraction strength. So um, stimulation via our parasympathetic nervous system onto these M2 receptors is going to slow our heart and decrease the contraction strength of our heart. Um, most smooth muscle has M3 receptors. Uh, activation will cause contraction. So you know, as we are in sort of a resting state where we're not in danger, we can have our muscarinic receptors activated, uh, allowing the contraction of that smooth muscle. Um, M3 also mediates the secretory, secretory responses of the autonomic nervous system, that is, the secretion of various substances, including salivation and lacrimation or crying. Um, in addition, uh, the vagus nerve can, uh, can innervate the pancreas with acetylcholine signaling, which will result in the release of insulin. Okay, finally, let's talk about a few uh, notable muscarinic drugs. So first off is muscarin, which um, is what the receptor is named after, right? This is a receptor agonist, so it's an agonist of the muscarinic receptor that's isolated from a mushroom called Amanita muscaria, also called a uh, fly Amanita. Uh, this mushroom also contains mucimol, which is an agonist of the uh, GABA receptor that we'll talk about later on. But uh, importantly, muscarinic mushroom contains muscarin, which is a receptor agonist um, for that receptor. Uh, this results in exaggerated parasympathetic responses, so things like lacrimation, salivation, sweating, pupil constriction, abdominal pain, etc. So uh, that mushroom looks like this. You may have seen this uh, around or just seen it as like sort of like a common depiction of mushrooms. So this is a muscarinic mushroom. 
that will make you uh, pretty uncomfortable. Uh, it also shows up in video games sometimes. This is a screenshot from Skyrim. Uh, this won't make you resist fire or like better at fighting, but it will make you pretty sick. So don't listen to Skyrim's potion making advice. Okay, we also have the receptor uh, antagonists atropine and scopolamine, which you may have heard of. Um, these are alkaloids that come from plants, including uh, deadly nightshade, which is called Atropa belladonna. So atropine you may have heard of or encountered. Uh, it's used to dilate pupils and reduce secretions that clog airways. So if you've been to the eye doctor and they put in those drops that dilate your eyes, uh, make your, dilate your pupils rather, that's atropine. Um, so these will, uh, that can dilate your pupils. It um, gets its name, uh, Belladonna, you know, beautiful woman. Uh, people used to use um, drugs like this, or substances like this, to dilate the pupils, which was seen as an attractive quality. Uh, scopolamine is also a receptor antagonist that can produce drowsiness, euphoria, amnesia, fatigue, and even a dreamless sleep. Uh, high doses of antagonists can lead to halluc hallucinations and even death. Okay, that wraps up our discussion of acetylcholine. I'll see you.